Bam, ba -da -dum, ba -da 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 -dum, Here I am, Facebook Live, coming at you, R. Christian Minson, Rhythmia's Facebook Live, Friday edition, Breathwork edition, and uh, we are ready to rock and roll today with the subject of emotional intelligence, the emotional intelligence system. Just giving a few moments to get people online. Welcome to the first three that have shown up. Uh, Doreen, hey, Doreen Ann. And uh, say hi to me, give me where you're from, all that kind of stuff in the chat bar. Get used to using the chat, get used to giving me some thumbs up. Hey, Christine, it's your birthday today, isn't it? Or was it just yesterday? I think it was today. Uh, so many things have gone on since uh, this morning. Fanny, hello. Ellie, hello. Amanda, hello. And Jerry, or Jenny, sorry. Welcome, welcome. Uh, if you join on, uh, in the recording, skip to about four minutes in, and you'll skip all this introductory stuff. Um, I am here at Rhythmia Andy. Hey, I'm seeing a lot of names that I recognize. Uh, so welcome, welcome. And uh, we got a great, great class today, a great Facebook Live. If you want to uh, what do you call it is however you want to say it uh, I'm just gonna wait for a few people to come in so as you're coming on in say hi to me with some faces some up oh, always an angry face in there somewhere so if you're angry at me let me know why too we're talking about emotional intelligence today so it's, we can we can discuss our feelings if there's anything I'm saying that that irks you in some way, that brings up some uh, emotions that, rather than hold it in, which uh, is part of what we'll be talking about. Let it out. Let yourself express it. But of course, express it intelligently is the real goal here. But we got a lot of people. Pennsylvania, Belinda from Florida, Sheila, hello, Stacy Lynn, Stacy, Stacia. i seen you a few times. When are you coming here, Stacia? Michelle, Jenny um, from Tennessee, Joe Pullinger, hey, hey, man, good to see you. Um, Andy saying hello, Randy saying hello from Northern California. Uh, good, we're getting off to a good start a few minutes in. We give one more minute to, to say some hellos, say uh, let you know, I'm back at Rhythmia, Life Advancement Center here in Costa Rica. Two weeks until Christmas, or at least our winter break, starts on December 23rd. So we're closed for the week from the 23rd until about the 28th, which we start up again and usher you in for the new year. I believe, I don't know if we're sold out for that or not yet, but um, new year, what a great time to come here, uh, set your Set your intentions for the new year and really magnify them through the, this process and the, the medicines and the breath work. Portland, Oregon, Southern California, Heather, Gord and Sydney and Michelle Dixon. I'm coming back again in March with three friends. Excellent, Michelle. Excellent. So here we are uh, getting in 26, 25 and coming up on four minutes. So I am going to begin officially. Welcome, everyone. My name is Christian, Christian Minson, director of the Breathwork Program here at Rhythmia Life Advancement Center in Guanacaste, Costa Rica, the northwestern corner of the, the country, uh, where it's ever sunny, ever warm. Sometimes it rains, but even the rain is warm. Uh, I am a breath facilitator for the last 12 years, senior trainer, I've traveled all over the world working this breathwork program and sharing it with the world. I was a monk for 10 years before that, uh, working with meditation techniques which were breath oriented, essentially breathing, modified breathing techniques to help us attain higher states of consciousness. And so I've got about 20 years of experience there in the breathwork. I'm a a speaker sp spoken around the world. Kuwait is one of the interesting places that I've spoken. Spoken for the Kashi Company. Uh, I'm an author, contributed to this book back here, Align, Expand, and Succeed, Shifting the Paradigm of Entrepreneurial Success, which is all about merging consciousness and business. 
consciousness has been my passion and my, my focus, my mission to elevate my consciousness and those around me for the last 20 some odd years. So welcome. Uh, and uh, so today we're talking about the, uh, the aspect of consciousness that involves emotion, the emotional intelligence system. And uh, so without further ado, let's get into a Gord saying welcome back up from Ontario, Canada, Ontario. I was just there briefly visiting my aunt. I love to say I had a 35 year standing date with my aunt back when I was 15 years old. Uh, apparently I was a little snarky then and she said, why don't we get together when you turn 50 and uh, we'll, we'll discuss uh, your views on life then as opposed to now, which was, again, when I was 15. And we just did that. Um, I had my 50th birthday in April, and uh, we, we didn't get together then. And I was like, how am I going to do this? And I got managed to get up to Canada uh, just a couple weeks ago and got to Ontario, got to Ottawa where she is, went out to eat, and we had that conversation. And, and I'll just say that uh, my – my life perspective has changed somewhat since I was 15 years old. I don't seem to know as much as I did back then, and, uh, I'm, but I'm happier for it, and I'm willing to admit that. And so um, it's all good, but I love that we, we made that date 35 years ago and that we actually, uh, actually made it happen, brought it to fruition, brought it into manifestation. So... Um, so anyway, that was an aside. We're talking today about the emotional intelligence system, really the importance of emotions in our lives and how to intelligently engage with them. Uh, this is really a subject dear to me because uh, it's probably my biggest growth edge. I've made tremendous leaps and bounds in my life uh, in the realms of emotional intelligence. And for all the leaps and bounds I've made, I probably, if in the greater spectrum of, of emotional intelligence, I'm probably that far along the line of, of what needs to come. Uh, but, you know, because my story, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, fairly successful now. I've been, I've been at Rhythmia here a year plus, uh, really um, I've been in the transformational business for the last 20 years. Uh, spoken and, and presented all over the world, um, you know, having fun, um, work in my life, and, and really, really feel on purpose and on fire at this stage of the game. But it wasn't always that way. And, you know, if I look back at my origins, I was raised in a military family, uh, which meant that, uh, well, in this family, the, the basic motto was "Big boys don't cry," and uh, I did a I did a Facebook live a few weeks ago on "Big kids don't cry," and uh, so there's a, a lot of crossover here. You might reference that video if you haven't seen it after this one today. So uh, anyway, uh, you know, "Big boys don't cry" is a very stoic, very unemotional profession, the military. Uh, I mean, uh, they pretty much breed emotion out of you because you can't go to battle and look another human in the eye and pull a trigger if you're emotional about it. So, uh, so I was very shut down emotionally. And as a result, I was very unexpressive in my feelings and, and just in general. Uh, as a result, all those emotions don't die, as, as I've quoted the psychotherapist Sigmund Freud before, that says, Unemotion unexpressed emotions never die, they just reemerge in darker and uglier ways. And uh, for me, I love the thumbs up, keep them coming. For me, those darker and uglier ways was moods. Uh, you get moody, and uh, these emotions leak out and just darken your experience. I could be at a, a really festive party. Everybody's having a great time and I'm sulking over there in the corner because, you know, I, uh, an onset of these, these emotions would come up that, that I wasn't really aware of and didn't have control over. I tried to suppress, but eventually they get the better of you. Um, 
So I was painfully introverted as a result, not knowing how to express these things, not you know, uh, feeling very out of place when everybody's happy and I'm not. Um, and so I wasn't able to communicate well. Uh, so a number of significant things happened as a result of that. First, you know, it's painful to hold on to unexpressed feelings. And to, to mitigate that pain, I got involved in drinking and drugs and, uh, you know, to the point where I actually got, uh, got arrested by the police at one stage in my life, uh, you know, high school, college, getting into college age. Um, I was so closed down that my relationships were, were just pitiful. I mean, relationships are built on communication, and of course, with no communication. The only way my girlfriend could get me to communicate was to nag me and nag me and nag me and nag me. She'd nag me so much until finally I couldn't stand it anymore. I just broke down, cried, and, and you know, and then started arguing with her, which was which brought her to life because at least she was getting some kind of response then. We were, were actually communicating, albeit on a very low level, but it was better than not communicating at all as far as she was concerned. Um, and, you know, the pinnacle of this whole thing happened when basically I was, I, I was working at the time uh, as a graphic designer, and I went into the office one day, and they called me into the boss's office and sat me down and said, we're going to have to let you go. We're laying you off. And, and I asked why, and they, you know, they just didn't feel like I was a team player. They, my lack of ability to communicate my feelings and, and my point of view and all that was seen as not really participating, not really being an integrated part of the group. So they let me go. And that was really my wake up call for, uh, for a lot of things. But that really started me on a, a deep spiritual quest. And, um, you, you know, I went home that night and, and just cried to God or whatever was out there to say, Show, give me a sign. There's got to be something more to this. And in that moment, I was given the sensation of what I'd say is like I felt this aquifer of peace, this, this underground river of peace flowing within me. I felt like it was deep in me. I felt like it was there. I felt like it was always there and that it was me. I just had to figure out how to drill down and get to it. And, and so that got me quickly on a spiritual quest. I started meditating. I, I uh, became a monk. I eventually got into breath work. And it was really breath work that began to help me expand my sense of my emotions. Um, breath work in one particular uh, experience, which I again, I go into the story a lot more in this Big Kids Don't Cry video, so, uh, so I want you to watch that. Uh, but I w went to church one day, Father's Day. The minister gave this poem of a father who was, who was lamenting because his son was now at war. It was in World War II, and as, uh, as a son at war, he, the father had realized that all his life he'd, he'd been the stoic presence and never, you know, big boys don't cry and not showing emotion. And now that his son was away at war and potentially could die, he realized that, uh, you know, the folly of his actions and really wished that he could hug his son and tell him he loved him. And this was all in the poem. Long story short, that poem made me bawl like a baby. And um, that was one of the first releases. That was the first time I had cried in 15 years, probably. And and that started a release that helped me uh, get into a better emotionally intelligent state today. Like I said, still just still feel like I'm scratching the surface, but um, oh boy, do I feel a lot better than when I was holding it all in. Um, you know, now uh, you know now in my job, I continue to explore emotional intelligence in my own life. And I, I coach people in the better emotional intelligence, primarily through the, through the um, spiritual perspective that I've gained over the years and the, uh, the breathwork techniques that, that I've learned. And good, lots of people joining on. I'm just going to say hi in bulk right now. Excellent. So, you know, this is a, this is a profound subject and, and, and why. If we think about it, we are we're multidimensional beings, physical, 
mental, emotional, spiritual, and we want to we want those dimensions to be in balance. Essentially, four dimensions, uh, and the emotional dimension is a huge one. And if uh, you know the um, this is the dimension that's probably the most ignored or suppressed is like acts like we don't we don't really um, need it. And I'll talk about why that was in a little bit. But if you really, you know, if you think about it, when, uh, when I was researching this topic, emotional intelligence, there was this research in 2002 that said that IQ, your, your brainiac intelligence, is responsible for only 25% of one's chances for success in later life. And then in a 1994 study, that suggested that it was more closer to 5%. So saying that our intelligence, our our mind, you know, developing, developing our smarts, so to speak, was responsible for only five to 25% of our success, where um, there was an analysis of 515 senior executives, and they found that high emotional intelligence, however they rated it, uh, suggested that they were more likely to succeed than both high IQ or intelligence and previous work experience. So, of course, we would naturally think that somebody who has a lot of work experience and has, you know, is really smart is much more likely to succeed than somebody who's just, say, emotionally present and emotionally intelligent. But, but in an analysis, it found that those who actually had the highest emotional intelligence were showing more success factors than both more intelligent and, and more work experience. Um, John Scott, hey, welcome. And Sophie Lefebvre, welcome. So uh, that is one reason. And then finally, uh, just to say, three main reasons for failure um, in leadership positions was, one, difficult, difficulty in handling change. Two, inability to work well in a team. And three, poor interpersonal, poor interpersonal relationships. Um, and so all of these involve uh, deficiencies in emotional intelligence. So, um, you know, if, if for the reasons of just being able to express your emotions and, and feel more of life isn't enough, emotional intelligence is a critical factor in how successful you will be in your life and perhaps is uh, number one or very close to the top as far as that success is concerned. So it's a huge topic and, and one that's uh, definitely timely definitely continues to, um, I can see the wave, the tide changing slowly in our society where we're getting more emotionally intelligent, starting to ask the hard questions, starting to feel the hard feelings and uh, all that. So, um, you know, some benefits of emotional intelligence. First, you, you know, you, you have the capacity to overcome difficult situations. You're not just stonewalled or or feel like you have no options or or feel helpless but but um you can remain calm you can figure out solutions and uh and then progress in your life um you can express yourself better clearly but warmly i mean some people are very clear and cold uh clear and to the point perhaps i'm i'm maybe that way a little bit much uh, being in aries and all that you know i just want to get to the point but you know, having a little emotional intelligence gives you a chance to warm your message a little bit. So deliver it clearly, but deliver it warmly. Uh, emotional intelligence helps you build better relationships. Uh, you, you know, and I can certainly attest to that. The more, the more communication about emotions uh, that I put on the table, the more that um, that we really look at the things that perhaps. I was hiding from before, the more my relationships just get stronger and stronger. And uh, that's, that's not just uh, limited to me, but it's a universal thing. Uh, waving, catching what I can at work. Good. Mary Beth, hi. Chris, uh, um, might we be the only two in Wyoming, is that? Yeah, possibly. 
I've been twice already and can't wait to go again. Uh, I'd love to come to Jackson there, Chris. So um, consider it an invitation. Uh, so having emotional intelligence helps you keep your emotions under control. And I don't like that word control because it's more like it helps you manage your emotions properly. Uh, you know, which means that you know when to rein them in and when to let them flow more appropriately rather than either stuffing them like was my case or having them just be like a, a series of wild horses that, that just overruns you, which um, sometimes people find themselves in. Uh, so, and then maybe the bottom line is that it's just emotional intelligence helps you increase your own well-being. You feel better. You feel better because you're better at feeling. You, you learn how to manage your, your states of feeling. You learn not to run from those hard feelings. You learn not to hoard all those you know, the good feelings and are always afraid looking over your shoulder of when your happiness is going to leave and when you're going to meet sadness again. But, but really, having a good relationship with all of your emotions ends up, in the long run, giving you a higher quality of life. Even if you're sad, you appreciate that sadness. You understand the sadness. You learn to get a message from that sadness, and it um, helps, you, uh, helps you in your life. So what is emotional intelligence? What are we really talking about when we talk about emotional intelligence? Uh, uh, in books like this one, Emotional Intelligence, um, the, you know, the scholars have defined is like a four-point four thing. Two really have to do with yourself. Two have to do with others. And the first is really emotional intelligence is about being able to um, recognize to feel and understand your emotions. So I say recognize, understand, and ultimately feel your emotions is, is the first aspect of emotional intelligence. And I can attest to that. When I was emotionally shut down, I really didn't know what my feelings were. Um, I didn't uh, understand this energies and how to, how to work with it. And I certainly wasn't good at just expressing it, at feeling it. So that's the first dimension of emotional intelligence. The second is to be able to, um, to really express and manage those feelings to, you know, once you, once you recognize them and, and understand what they are, it's actually to, to be able to fully express them, but, but manage them intelligently. Like I said, not to suppress them, but not to let them overrun you, but, but to recognize that they're a dimension of our being that needs control like we control a wave when we're surfing, right? You, you're never in control of the wave, but you can learn how to harness the energy of that wave. So we learn how to harness the energy of our emotions to help us in our lives rather than just bowl us over. Uh, let's see, just looking at people. You mean running, stuffing them down and stomping them into the dirt of denial isn't managing? <laughs> All right, John. That's his, uh, that's his sarcastic humor there. And yes, that's what I mean. That's not managing. Um, uh, so then there's the two others oriented thing. First is to recognize um, the feelings of others, to, to have a certain amount of empathy, to not just be a um, narcissistic psychopath or, you know, to, to recognize that the feelings are a two way street and that others have feelings and that how you're going to interact with them is based largely on, on the signals of feeling that you're getting from them. And then ultimately is to manage the impact of your feelings on others. So, so the two of yours, feel your feelings and, and recognize them, uh, express and manage them for yourself, then for others, recognizing others have feelings and, and tuning in empathetically and managing your feelings in a relationship so that you're not uh, either dominating them with your feelings or your feelings are, are uh, causing you to be dominated by them or otherwise. So, uh, Randy Nichols, I was contemplating the difference between mood and a state the other day. Can you please touch on that? Somebody asked me if awake 
consciously is a mood. Um, a mood and a state. I don't know. I mean, a state, to me, right off the top of my head, the state would just be a state of consciousness. You could be, you could be in an unemotional state. You could be in a, a meditative state. You could be in a, um, an agitated state. You could be in, uh, you know, from calm to, to uh, worked up. Anywhere in that realm could be a, a state. Uh, your mood would, would denote what emotions are behind that, you know. Um, and the way I used mood was sort of in a more negative way. I mean, you could, you could use mood in general to say, what's your mood today? Well, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm relaxed and happy. I'm, uh, you know, I'm a little melancholy. I'm, I'm sad and depressed. Those could be moods. Or as I was saying, I, when I talk about getting moody, I really talked about the energy of emotions that ideally should be expressed, being repressed and then bubbling up, leaking out over the edges, and then creating, creating emotional states, moods that are incongruent with what's going on around you. So that's how I specifically used mood in, in uh, my conversation just a little while ago. Um, but hopefully that gives you uh, some kind of sense between mood and state. Uh, hey, Johnny. Hey, Kristen. So um, getting into this now, you know, through my experience and, and work, I really realized that there's one major problem with uh, emotional intelligence, and that's what I call emotional constipation. And if you think about you know, what, what constipation means to you. It's kind of a, a holding, right? Emotional constipation is really holding on to our emotional energies, energies that otherwise, if given their own devices, would flow. Would flow and emotion comes up, flows out of you, it's expressed, eventually it's released and you can you know, go through another cycle. If you're constipated, you're backed up. You know, your pipes are backed up and so nothing's moving, nothing's flowing. In most emotional constipation, your emotional energy is backed up, so now you don't have the capacity to be present to your emotional experience. You're kind of locked up in this emotions. And there's, I've identified five mistakes or five causes that really um, contribute to this emotional constipation. And one is treating emotions like an affliction. Uh, this really comes from our Victorian age, the 1800s, I believe. What's the Victorian age, right? Um, there, uh, hysteria um, was an ailment that they, they might lock you away um, forever. You know, it was a mental disorder, hysteria. Um, they, they weren't very uh, psychologically astute back then. So the, the kind of treatments for, for any kind of condition like this were pretty severe. And they thought that over-emotionality was a precursor to hysteria. So of course, people kept a suppressed demeanor, right? If your emotions came out, you might get pegged as hysterical, and next thing you know, you might end up in an institution for the rest of your life with no chance of getting out. Um, another, the second uh, mistake people often make is trying to control their emotions. And this was, you know, this is largely my experience um, you know we take the stoic approach like emotions don't matter we can press them down to solve life's problems with pure intelligence is the way to go and, and the clean clear way to get solutions and answers is a very masculine approach um, uh, but and there's some value in that but really um, life is about balancing your your emotional input with your uh, with your intelligence input, your mental input. So another, the third way that we uh, deal dysfunctionally with emotions is to sedate them. Um, this is really numbing ourselves to our emotions. So they're coming up, we don't know how to deal with them, we don't like them. You might drink yourself into a sedated state, you might take drugs, you might watch TV, you might um, over, uh, overemphasize your sexual relations and all that, all in an effort 
to, to sedate those emotional feelings, to, to numb them out. Uh, the fourth way that we, we deal with this is, is drama. So drama is a way of displacing our emotions and, and drama is, is pretty prevalent in, in life. You know, the fact it, it's, um, uh, you know, it's where we, uh, where, what can I say here? <laughs> Just remembering all the dramatic experiences of my past life that were, uh, it just, you know, why? Why did I have to go through that? And because I didn't know yet, I didn't learn yet. Uh, but drama, making, uh, you know, making a big deal about something that isn't a big deal um, because it's like making mountains out of molehills because really that, um, like my girlfriend was trying to do in the story I, I re uh, recounted in the beginning, poking at me, poking at me, um, nagging and nagging and nagging. This was all, you know, a lot of drama going on till finally there was an explosion and more drama. And it, it's like, as humans, we seem to be drama junkies. If there's, if there's action, if there's a lot of fireworks and sparks, then we feel like, like life is happening. Um, but we got to get used to the fact that like the calm, centered, even keeledness really is where we can experience even more life. And uh, so that's where drama kind of over emoting, like being, uh, you know, putting too much emphasis on our emotions uh, in an attempt to, uh, to feel them. And then finally, uh, you know, one of the biggest, mistakes we make about dealing with our emotions is not being present and by not being present we dwell either too much in the future or too much in the past and i've come up against this a lot lately that whenever i feel uh disconcerted or out of sorts inevitably my mind is dwelling on the future and as soon as i bring it back in the present and just look at where i am and deal with what's in front of me I instantly feel better. I instantly feel like, you know, this is manageable. Life is good. I've got every, everything I've got around me is good. Why do I need to, um, you know, press the issue and make myself feel like I, I need to be all upset? And the same thing goes with dwelling in the past. The, the future tends to result in anxiety and stress. Dwelling in the past Tends to tends to get you dwelling in regret and shame and um, that kind of thing. So and I know people are saying some stuff. What about physical pain and the sadness that's created from it? Any tips on how to deal with that? Um, the, my tips are to feel it. I will um, we'll talk in a minute about how how to deal with things. So uh, and breath work is a major key. So maybe. Um, Let's save that for when I say that. And by deal, I mean separate and allow it to flow through and not stay in sadness. Yeah, that's kind of it. Bored is saying to breathe. And uh, <laughs> that's where I'm headed here. So hold on to that, Mary Beth. Um, plants can help with physical pain as well, one in particular. And um, yeah, so I would say, Gord, dare, dare I say, you're probably talking about cannabis. Uh, it is a pain mitigating thing. It's also one that can uh, cause that sedation. So we do have to be careful in the use, whether you're um, managing pain or sedating your emotional response. Uh, uh, another plant, the plant medicine that we serve here, uh, has tremendous effects on alleviating pain, which often goes to the deeper root of, of something dwelling in your subconscious that we finally uproot and, and expose and integrate, and then the physical pain magically or magically disappears. Uh, but it's a, actually a very um, scientific process because it, it works like clockwork. Uh, so here we are into how, how to deal with this emotional intelligence a little bit better. And um, one thing, you know, just to understand that if you are on a path of awakening, if you're on a path of elevating your consciousness, 
which I dare say, if you are watching this now that you are, you are one of these people, then understand that you will be attracted to people who will push you to confront your emotional limits. That means wherever you're at. So back when I couldn't express myself, you know, I got a naggy girlfriend because she pushed me to, to confront my emotional limits. Nowadays, I'm a little bit more emotionally intelligent and the, the people that I'm bringing into my life are really helping me to develop a deeper emotional dialogue, a, a way to, to um, be comfortable with the emotions that, that I currently haven't been comfortable with, to be able to express those emotions openly. And, um, you know, of course, it helps if, if the person you're expressing to is, is emotionally intelligent and, and can receive those emotions in a way. So that, um, so it's the, your, your partners, your friends, your companions are going to meet you at the level of pushing you into the, the next dimension of emotional intelligence. So know that life, life is not about you, you finally make it, now you can rest on the couch and, and get the, uh, the potato chips and watch football all day or um, whatever girls like to watch. Uh, soap operas, dare I say. Don't want to be uh, sexist here, but whatever you, you know, to say that you, um, that there is no happily ever after in the sense that you've, you've made it, now you can rest, and the rest of your life you, don't, you can coast. You don't have to work at it. Life is about constant evolution, in this case, constantly feeling our emotions and uh, using, um, using our surroundings, using our companions to help us uh, raise to the next level. So Jenny's saying, so breath work will help with social anxiety. Most definitely plant medicine eliminated my PTSD, but not social anxiety. Yes, um, the breath work can help uh, like that. John Scott, anxiety constipation seems to be due to such a habit identifying myself as that releasing it adds more. What, what will be left for me kind of thing. What will be left of me, yeah. From there, dealing with it while present presents getting stuck dismissing all right, so um, I'm not ha sure how to respond to that, John. Um, need a little bit, a uh, uh, little bit more information if you want me to make a comment on that. Gord, I feel fear drives the illusion of anxiety. Yeah, outlook is everything. If you truly believe there's nothing to be anxious about, it will diminish. Uh, there's a there's a lot to say about that. Nagging is that negative? Is is that negative term in her doing? Um, negative term on her doing. Uh, the in that context, yeah, it was it was negative. It was it was a very dysfunctional relationship. Like I said, you're you're met with the people who can push you to the emotional intelligence level that you're ready for. So in that point in time, I was not ready for somebody who actually was very intelligent in their emotions and could you know, could hand me the opportunity to express myself back to them and, and hold an intelligent conversation. So, you know, I attracted somebody who was really, you know, had an emotional issue themselves and that fights were their way of, of knowing that, that love was present in a very warped way. It was like, if you, if you fought and then eventually you know, made up, then there was, there was love there. And uh, of course, who wants to live that way, right? Uh, probably a lot of us do. And that this is why we're talking about this, that this is, this way eats at your health, eats at your harmony, eats at your, your positive outlook in life. And it, it's not, it's really not very pleasant. But in the con, in, you know, in the greater context, at that moment, it pushed me out of my, my zone. So uh, I wouldn't really call it a, a, a positive term. I, I would relate it more to negative, but in, in general, it, it's, it's all neutral. That uh, it helped me progress on my path, but now that I'm a little more emotionally intelligent, I'm much, uh, much happier with my companions who can help me um, you know, intelligently continue that conversation and that growth. 
hope so hopefully that makes some sense um and Gord saying at least you learned something from it and used it as a catalyst to better yourself exactly and that's and that really is uh perhaps one of the fundamental tenets of the emotional intelligence is you know there are no wrongs there are no mistakes there are you know there's nothing to be uh to beat yourself up about as long as you're learning as long as you take your experience and say all right well that didn't go so well what could i do better next time and make that next time better and you know, progress is is baby steps baby steps anybody see that um what was that uh <laughs> some movie about with steve martin in it a while back um he was always talking about, he was like a psych, psychotherapist or something. He's talking about baby steps, baby steps. So you take these little steps, and um, if you can take a baby step, it's, an accept, it's a success in that day. Um, and yeah, um, so accustomed to identifying myself as anxious, realized that I was clinging to it, still working on dealing with anxiety while it's present. Uh, involved a lot of things I'm happier leaving past tense um, so I said what I'm getting there is just the identification with anxiety and that's it we, a lot of things we hold on to because this is an ego mechanism our ego is most comfortable with what's known our ego is very uncomfortable with the unknown so the ego tries to keep you safe by keeping you in the realm of the known so if you're anxious and tense all the time, the ego gets used to that and says, hey, you're, you're trying to let go of that? We're not so sure what's, you know, if you let go of that, what are you going to be? Who are you going to be left? What's, what's going to be there for you? And so it, it, it struggles to hold on to that identification with that anxiety. And this is, if you recognize that mechanism, that's where, you know, the intelligence can hit in. You can take a leap of faith. Because if you can really understand that you're almost 99.99% sure that if you can let go of anxiety, that something better is going to come back in its place. And so you take that chance. And when it does, the ego starts to get comfortable with that. And then that becomes your new box, your new, uh, you know, the new known for the ego. And this is, this is the, the constant battle of evolution, is expanding our box getting comfortable in that box and then pushing ourselves out of the boundary of that box so that we can expand it a little more. We get more comfortable in that, but then we got to keep expanding, getting uncomfortable, get comfortable, expand, expand. Uh, whether we're talking about emotions, whether we're talking about spirituality, whether we're talking about um, intellectual understanding, you know, growth in our jobs, growth in our personal lives, you name it. This is the, the constant battle, getting uncomfortable, to expand the box, to get more comfortable in a bigger box, only to get more uncomfortable to expand it again and again. Uh, uh, Michelle, in gratitude to me, ah, oh, thank you, Michelle. I, I, I will appreciate, I do appreciate and will gladly accept any expressions of gratitude or uh, um, wonderful, uh, wonderful emotional expressions that way. And I accept anything if people are finding that, uh, they think I'm barking up the wrong tree or you've got a, a what do you call it, a, a contrary point of view or whatever, I'm happy to discuss that. This is not uh, about me saying this is how it is. Uh, I like to offer perspectives based on my experience and my learning and then give you a chance to try that on. I know that lots of this uh, has shown to work not only in my life but the life of my clients the uh, life of of others who have helped me so take that as you will but i um i appreciate i appreciate all of you for for engaging and being present in this ellie's saying i really think being present can escalate your learning process knowing right then what's going on instead of thinking about later our positive instead of thinking about it later our positive steps yeah so this is really getting into what I'm talking about here how so first you understand that you're on the path of awakening so when something happens that's that agitates you you can say hey that's the good news I'm 
I'm now in a new lesson. I'm now in the process of awakening. Um, it really comes down to uh, much of what Ellie's talking about is reacting versus responding or responding versus reacting. And uh, reacting is really um, a past-oriented issue. We have something that happened to us in the past now, and we've stuffed it down. Now we have an issue that happens to us in the present that's similar to what happened to us in the past. Instead of being present to that experience, we draw the past back and overlay it on this present experience. And then we're no longer actually even dealing with this present moment experience. We put this facade up that this is a past experience and we react, we act again the same way we did in the past. So we come back in, engage with this person like we did with this person in the past. And now this person's saying, what the heck, man? You know, where is this coming from? You ever had that? And, you know, what are you, why are you so mad at me? What's going on? What's the, what's the problem here? Because they don't even get that you're not even reacting to what they did. You're reacting to something that happened way back in the past and you're just overlaying it on this person. So that's reaction. Responding is uh, sort of what Ellie's saying, um, being present, taking a deep breath, finding that maybe this thing triggers something in the past, but instead of immediately putting it over, you take a deep breath, you do whatever you can to put some space in between you and the present, you know, and that reaction. And then you engage that person uh, in the present. You say, this is a new person. This is a new situation with new variables, with, with unique solutions. How am I going to respond? All right, how am I going to, to choose to behave in this unique situation? It may ultimately be the same as I did in the past, but more likely it's gonna be different and more intelligent because uh, you know, I'm learning from my past experiences. And let's bring it up a few comments. I love it. Thanks, whoops. Says, thanks for these reminders. I'm pushing through these emotional barriers that don't serve us. Thank you, Susie. I do appreciate your talks. Thanks, Randy and Robin. Very good explanation. All right. Nothing like soliciting a few uh, positive comments to get a few back. And I, I certainly appreciate all of that. And uh, I appreciate most just the interactivity, that this is something that we can discuss together and of course, if you've got any experiences in emotional intelligence, either failures or victories, and again, failures are only uh, failures in the sense that it didn't work that time, it's giving you more information to ultimately succeed somewhere else. So I don't consider anything a failure. But getting back into it, reacting versus responding. Um, so there's three steps really here. First, you want to learn the relationship between your breath and your emotions. All right, so this is how, how we're, I should reframe this and say, how we're using breath work to help us, um, to help us in the process of, of greater emotional intelligence. So the first step is to recognize the relationship between our breath and our emotions. That each emotion that we have has actually a corresponding breath pattern. Uh, and as such, we can actually if you get good at this, you can watch how people breathe and you can tell a lot about what's going on in them. If they say something and they, they breathe a certain way, you can kind of tell if they're nervous about that, if they're, if they're really telling the truth, if they're, um, you know, if they're excited about it or whatever. Um, but then you can use it once you know that your different breath patterns, uh, come along with different emotions, we can learn to reverse engineer that and recognize that we can create different emotions by inducing different breath patterns. So a breath pattern for an emotion we don't like tends to be shallow and rapid or we kind of hold our breath all together. Whereas emotions that we more enjoy and emotions that are healthier for us tend to come with a deeper, uh, fluid, more, uh, more flowing breath pattern. And that 
is what we practice in the, the breath techniques that, that we do here at Rhythmia that I, that I teach on my own and, um, and so on. We're learning, we're, we're taking a breath pattern that's inducing peaceful emotions, that's inducing happy emotions, that's indu in, inducing emotions of, of balance. And by, by bringing, by continuing to breathe, we actually bring those emotional states to our being. So when we're combating anxiety, that's exactly what we need to do is recognize that, first of all, we have, may have habituated ourselves to anxiety by breathing in these short, shallow breaths or holding our breath a lot. So that's the first thing, awareness, that your breath is actually helping perpetuate your anxious state. And this may uh, be good for you, John Scott. Um, then we start to modify our breathing. We catch that. We go, oh, start taking a few good, full, deep breaths till we start to feel calmer, till we start to feel more peaceful, more happy. And um, practicing this technique, getting sessions, coming to Rhythmia and all this is are ways to get yourself to start habituating your breath to, to commonly uh, breathe in this full free-flowing pattern. And thereby, your, your everyday state changes from mildly or severely anxious to mildly or abundantly peaceful or happy or, or such. So hopefully that's making sense. Um, I guess I've been one of those reactors, lots of big lessons, trying to learn to respond now. Beautiful. Christine says that's interesting. Love it. Um, oh, John, losing the patterns it can be tough. Uh, good. So, so the second then is to begin to let go of the past, right? So we said reacting really is spurned on by the fact that we've got a past, that we've got this past history that we draw into our future. So it's not that we ever get rid of our, our past, but we can actually modify our relationship to it. We don't have to, it doesn't have to hold this charge, this energy that keeps jumping into our, our present day situation at, at um, the catalyst of a, of a scenario that's similar to this one that happened in the past. So we can, uh, we, we do this again by engaging this breathwork technique. What we teach here at Rhythmia, what I teach, um, is, they're really sessions for emotional integration. We go into deeper, longer, hour-long sessions that get in and dredge up our old emotional energy, bring them to the surface, and ultimately neutralize that energy. We, we crack open the shell, the, the negative shell that we put on it, and then we see that this energy really is just a neutral energy that we can recycle into our being and use to focus on our higher dreams and aspirations. So we do that with that. We... Uh, we have some forgiveness exercises that are really helpful too. Often a lot of our held emotional states because we, we don't, we feel like something was done to us or we can't forgive others. We can't forgive ourselves. And as we learn to forgive, it actually helps us to let go of that situation, thereby releasing its charge. And it's the charge on that situation that causes it to want to jump into our, uh, our present scenarios. Whereas if it's decharged, if it's is neutral, and we have a new scenario, we get to be present to that scenario. There is no automatic jumping of this, this past energy. So the second step is really learning to let go of the past. You know, we've, uh, we learn the relationship of the breath to our emotions. Then we do the work to help us neutralize and let go of our past to, to reframe it, to, to rewrite our history, essentially. Um, and then... Um, Third and final step is becoming present to our emotional responsibility to to work on one now that we we go we go through the same breath process but instead of our our focus being on releasing the past and and neutralizing it our focus is really on anchoring in feelings of success feelings of goodwill feelings of um, uh, you know, progress and evolution. Uh, a lot of this is centered around intention setting, that we set an intention. We learn to set intentions for everything that we do. 
the more intentional we are with, with anything in our lives, the more we move in the direction of what we're really after. And then um, ultimately, I alluded to this earlier, but it really is an expanding of our, of our taste for all of our emotional uh, experiences. So you are as happy with being sad as you are with being happy. You're as peaceful with being at peace as you are with being a little anxious. You know, um, you're, you are as comfortable with anger as you are with, with joy and silliness. You know, all of these emotional states are not for us to be afraid of or, or deny, but to recognize their value in that they're delivering us a message they are they're telling us something about ourselves something about our our relationship to our environment and when we really receive them we can do something about it we just cut it off we stuff it away it's like getting mail um getting mail from somebody and not opening it and just stuffing it you know one guy says uh you you know you just won a million dollars you'll never know that if you never open that that mail or another says you know I noticed a gas leak outside of your house. So if you don't open that, that letter up, you're, you're never going to know and the, the gas leaks and your house blows up. You know, um, kind of a, a crazy scenario. Nobody's going to send you a letter for that. But hopefully you, you get the analogy that if we're not opening our mail, if we're not feeling our feelings, we're not receiving the message that those feelings have for us that um, could prevent us from... Uh, deeper disaster on down the line. Uh, so new comments. Uh, Robin Williams. I honestly thought when I removed ego, I started to understand things for what they were. And through that anxiety became a truth, I suppose. It's not anxiety, it was me believing it was anxiety. Now it's exciting feeling. Yeah, but I never really analyzed how much my breathing was playing a major role. I'm super glad I raced to watch live. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that, Robbie. And yeah, so they say that um, the difference between fear and excitement or anxiety and excitement is the breath. And excitement is that same feeling, but with a fluid flowing breath. Anxiety or fear is that same sensation, but without the breath, with the breath being shallow or the breath being held. And so when you're feeling fear and anxiety next time, try breathing deeply and see if you can transmute that into excitement. And, you know, uh, same scenario, we can be excited about it or we can be afraid of it. Um, beautiful, beautiful comment. So really, um, you know, when we're talking about this in relationships, then it really comes down to communication. Communication is, uh, you know, uh, something that I've had to learn. I'm still learning it. Uh, it, you know, you can communicate great in one area and then and not so great in others of your life. But really, just starting to to express your feelings, your true feelings. Getting in touch with those feelings first, you have to do your inner work, which is what we just talked about. Then expressing those and not being uh, you know, afraid that they're going to uh, cause you a backlash, which I think is a lot of why I held my feelings in a, for a lot of years, was I didn't want to deal with the potential, uh, the other energies that would come up around those, which uh, just you know, compounded the issue because eventually that stuff's going to come out. If it's you, if it's true to you, you've got to let it out. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, better that the consequences are, are dealt with up front rather than 20 years down the line, you've been married to somebody or whatever. And then you find out something that, Oh, they were for the last 18 years, they were dissatisfied. And, and now, you know, you're so deep in it that it's hard to, hard to really navigate your life from there. So communicate, take chances. Um, and of course you do want to assess who you're communicating with. Remember that if they're not uh, at least at some level of emotional intelligence, then, then there's only a certain, certain level, you'll meet them at that level. 
basically. Don't, don't get into, uh, don't think that you can just get into an emotionally intelligent conversation if, um, if both parties aren't at, at least at some level. Uh, so one of the ways to help with that is set some ground rules for, for safety and communication. There will be no talking before, you know, there'll be no interrupting or, you know, you're, you're allowed to say your piece before the other person responds. There's no raising of voices there. You know, you can say something. The other person has to repeat back what you said before they say anything back to you to, to clearly get a sense that they heard you before they get to respond. You know, rules and, and uh, guidelines like that can go a long way to helping you uh, in that communication. And, whoa, some more new comments. Anxiety is an illusion, a distortion. Oh, thank you. It definitely feels that way from my current vantage point anyway. Beautiful. Um, and... <laughs> Uh, and sorry, hey, sorry, he's coming in right at the end. So I uh, just, you know, want to wrap up I'm right at the top of the hour. So just to say, you know, you know, think about practicing emotional intelligence in your life. We, you know, we went over the fact that emotional intelligence is really one of the most critical factors for success in your life and even more so than your intelligence or your work experience. So, uh, it's really going to be to your advantage to, to invest in your own emotional intelligence. Um, the main problem with emotional intelligence is emotional constipation, where we hold back our emotions, you know, caused by those, those five different things, um, which was what, uh, um, what were the five, uh, treating your emotions as uh, an ailment, controlling them, sedating them, uh, expressing them dramatically, or, or not being present, dwelling in the future or the past. And, uh, and then, you know, the most effective ways to start working with your, uh, working on developing your emotional intelligence is working with the breath. I, I think, um, you know, I've been at this work, like I said, for 12 years, and I haven't found anything so foundational to our, our being that could affect so many areas of our being. That's why I love that Rhythmia has, has really recognized one of the few retreats, if not the only retreat in the world, that really puts breathwork on, on the top pedestal, right next to plant medicine. Maybe it's slightly below, but I think they're, they're both equally up there. Uh, that uh, working with your breath really is... Uh, probably the easiest inroad to working with your emotions, to helping you gain a greater, uh, a, a greater mm, relationship to all your emotional states. And so with that, let's just see any last comments. Like I said, outlook equals outcome. So Gord's replying to Robbie there. There's a conversation kind of going on. That's great. Um, and you know, feel free to continue to communicate with each other. Feel free to communicate with me. If you friend me on Facebook, I ask for one thing, and that is that you include a message that says where you saw me and why you want to, why you want to continue the conversation. Otherwise it's likely that I won't get around to that friend request, um, friend requests that come with messages. Instantly friends, uh, friend requests that don't come with messages. Uh, it takes me a while to, to vet those. Even if, you know, even if I uh, know you, and I know you clearly and soundly, you know, I may be able to get to it, but just be on the safe side and send me a message. I think that's good uh, social media etiquette anyway. And you know, would, you, would you say, hey, I want to be your friend to somebody and then never um, never communicate with them, or would you, you know, communicate with somebody and say, "Hey, I'm I'm Christian. You know, I live here. I've you know, been admiring you for a while. This, that, whatever. I uh, want to be friends." And so, you know, what scenario would you be more friends with somebody in? Perhaps that's a little lesson in emotional intelligence in and of itself. Social media emotional intelligence. All right, uh, oops, a few more comments as we come in. So let's see how that is. Thank you, thank you. 
from Denise, from Christine, Lisa, coming in January and experience the breath. We're beautiful. Great, Lisa. Ellie says, thank you. Um, this is awesome. Thanks for your time as always. Thank you, Robbie. I love that. And uh, one last thing, if you do have any topics or things you want to talk about, let me know. I'm happy to, to try to work them in in these Facebook Lives. But that's our Christian Minson signing off for this week's uh, Rhythm Me Alive. Let's see you down here sometime soon. Call this number above and get, this, get the skinny on how to get here. Uh, you won't regret it. I guarantee that. And so with that, namaste. We'll see you next week.